Okay, so that was really quick, but now we're gonna get into the nitty gritty of it. So once you get into the first chapter, um, hopefully you guys went and listened to the audiobook that I linked for you. The first line of this novel cracks me up because it is so Nick Care away, right? Nick Care away, so his cares are away, like pretty obvious. Um, not his best work as far as Fitzgerald goes, but it's interesting because the first line is actually a trick on the reader. It says, in my younger and more vulnerable years, my father gave me some advice that I've been turning over in my mind ever since. Whenever you feel like criticizing anyone, he told me, just remember that all the people in this world haven't had the advantages you have. When you think of the word advantages, people haven't had the advantages that you've had. The immediate mindset is to think of monetary advantages. We, and maybe it's a Western thing, but I have a feeling it's actually not. We have a tendency to think, oh, well, I was born with advantages. I was born with privilege. I was born in a nice house with a nice car and I had stable food and my parents had stable income. Um, I, I had those advantages, right? And I actually, in my book, I circled this one in green because that was my immediate response was it has to do with money. It's got to, it's got to do with money. But what you come to find out later on in the chapter is that he's not talking about monetary advantages. He's actually talking about moral advantages. He's talking about not everyone is born with parents that teach them morality or not everyone is born with internal morality. And that's kind of a question too. Are we born as human beings to be relatively good and the world can teach us to be evil? Or are there people out there that are just born evil? You know, are there people in this world who are, you know, born with a tendency to be amoralistic, to not care how their actions affect other people? So that's a that's another debate about the idea of individuality, especially within this society, right? Um, so Immanuel Kant goes into this whole question of like what creates morality and how do we know what morality is. The big philosophical idea for any AP lit kids or AP Lang kids that are reading this, it's Kant, K-A-N-T, Immanuel Kant, and it is the categorical imperative is what it's called. It's like how do we know what's right or just what I think is right, okay? So this first line, he immediately tricks the reader into realizing their own prejudice. When you hear the word advantage, you automatically are like, hey, well, he means monetary advantage. But if you go further on, we find out that all of the judgments, like he talks about um, the abnormal mind is quick to detect and attach itself to this quality, right? Um, he talks about how some people are born just sort of greedy and shallow, right? So sometimes people are just born greedy and shallow and they're not taught to not be that way. Sorry, my computer just finished doing the file thing. Um, and that's what he means by morality. But by tricking you as the reader, by using irony, right? Literary element, by using irony, meaning that you expect it to mean one thing, but actually it means something different. He's causing you to be aware for just a second. You step out of that cage, a cave of ignorance and you're like, oh, I did think that. I did think that he was talking about money, but he wasn't talking about money. He was actually talking about the idea of a moral compass that I was either born with or taught to have, and not everyone has that. That opposition between the idea of money equals morality or no money equals morality or where does money lie on this long list of how our society forms itself? How do we deal with the idea of capitalism? So for example, and you guys may have seen this recently in, in, in the world that we live in, there are a lot of people who are protesting right now about the idea that there are people who have lots and lots and lots of money, but they're not being moral with the way that they're spending their money. There are also people who are very moral and very good and who work very hard and are trying very hard but they don't have a lot, a lot of money. And if we were in a just society, should, then shouldn't the very good people, like the people who are nurses, the people who are EMTs, you know, the people who are firefighters and police officers who put their lives on the line, shouldn't they get paid the most amount of money as opposed to someone else who doesn't really do that much? Why do they get the most amount of money? Now, again, I can hear you guys right now. You're going, Gohanna, this sounds a lot like socialism. It makes me feel icky. You should have that reaction. You should immediately go, yeah, but. 
Every time your mind does that, every time your mind goes, yeah, but that's good. Remember, I'm an old debate coach. I want you to fight against me because that moment where it's not an easy answer, that's the sound of you coming out of the cage of enlightenment because you don't have an answer and that's what it should be. It should be you saying, yeah, but I think this and that and it doesn't quite connect. The problem of that is the beauty of metaphor. And within the first lines of this book, we get this amazing irony that creates this paradox and this problem. And now it's our job as readers to solve it. Um, and we're not gonna solve it because that's what life is about. And it's icky and it's messy and it's cool. And that's why reading books like this is cool because it creates all of these problems um, that aren't solvable, okay? All right, so we're gonna keep going. Again, you can skip through any of these videos. You don't have to walk down this avenue with me. I'm trying to do just a series of quick videos, um, small bites, let's chunk it. If it gets too much, step away and go outside. <laughs>